Today on Lockdown Red Wings, Prashanth Iyer joins us to talk Oliver Moore of the USNTDP and whether or not it was a successful season for the Detroit Red Wings. You're Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty's the host over at Lockdown Tigers. Five in a row, baby. Let's go. <laughs> World Series bound and picking up steam, right, Scotty? Yes, sir. You know it. And he's also uh, a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And I'll be remiss. If I don't remind you guys, Robbie Fabry stick giveaway tomorrow. Is, well, by the time you're listening to this, yeah, tomorrow yeah, will be tomorrow. your last day to enter the Robbie Fabry stick giveaway. So make sure you guys subscribe to our YouTube channel and submit uh, proof of that via DM or just a reply to the tweet. And then today, Scotty, we are joined by Prashant Iyer, uh, the newly crowned host of uh, Expected by Whom, co host of Expected by Whom, a winged wheel podcast. And Prashant, first of all, thanks for coming back to us a year later. And two, how's the new show going for you? Well, appreciate you extending the invite. As always, this is a fun time. So happy to uh, join you guys and, and and break down the wings a little bit. And then, yeah, you know, the show, uh, we, we've recorded one episode uh, that's been out for the public. We just recorded our second one earlier today. So we're we're excited. Things are things are rolling. It's exciting to be back in this game and 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 you know, yeah, we'll sort of see where it goes. But at the end of the day, I think what's most exciting is we've just got so many different outlets that cover the team in such a different capacity. And it's all it all works together. And so that's what's a lot that's what makes this fun. Yeah, absolutely. And we're really glad to have you back because when it comes to guys who I think un- I think when it comes to guys who understand the game on like an advanced analytical scale scale, you're probably number one uh, on most people's lists, at least on mine on guys I follow. <laughs> when I see when I see stats pumped out by Prashant Thayer, I go, oh, and usually when the Red Wings, it's actually kind of a little bit of an uh oh because the Red Wings <laughs> stats weren't that great. Uh, but that kind of leads me to where we want to start this episode because we're going to talk about Oliver Moore of the United States National Team Development Program. Second day in a row, we're going to be talking about that team. But I, I want to ask you first and foremost, Prashant, w- how you felt the Red Wings season went. I mean, Scotty and I talked about it on Monday's episode, whether or not we deemed it a success. I want to know if you thought it was a success and by what um, parameters you're measuring success by. Yeah, that's a that's a million dollar question here, because as, as you mentioned, everybody's got a different definition of success. You know, if you go back and you look at uh, what I had the wings doing at the beginning of the year, I had them at 81 points. They finished at 80. So from a success standpoint, yeah, they're kind of right in line with where I thought they would end up being. And and if you sort of take a broad step back and look at it, this was a team that was largely competitive longer than they have been in the prior you know five years. They made it all the way to the last two weeks of the season without having a sub Gary Bettman 500 record, uh, you know, being not, not including the overtime losses, but just straight up regulation, you know, yeah, yeah. Points percentage, you know, they were, they were, they were 500 team all the way up until the last couple of weeks of the season. And so just broadly saying that that's progress in terms of being a competitive hockey team under the hood or looking through the layers a little bit, I think there's still a fair bit of concern here. Um, You know, prior you know, maybe at the beginning of the season, the wings were when they were racking up their their wins. It wasn't necessarily because of dominant five on five play or dominant special teams. It's really just Billy Husev stood on, <laughs> yeah. and that was a very similar story to the year prior when Alex Nedeljkovic did the same, um, and the year prior when you had Jonathan Bernier do the same. And so, you know, that really carried them for a large part of the season. And kind of after. Uh, you know, January hit, Husso's game starts to slip a little bit. You know, Magnus Helberg's not a reliable backup. You know, Alex Adelkovich obviously went through his struggles this year before coming back. That first part of the season, all the way up until the trade deadline, even though the record looked good, the underlying numbers weren't exactly all that great. In fact, they weren't really all that much better than last year. 
really where I think you saw this team turn the corner, funnily enough, is after the trade deadline. After the trade deadline, even though all the the, the results start to go very poorly, and again, that's related to, to goaltending, this was actually a team that at five on five played probably as good as they could play, uh, you know, given everything they had, they had just sold off. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't believe me if I told you, but they're five on five expected goals for percentage. Again, measuring the quality of shots for and against after the trade deadline was 4% higher than it was pre trade deadline. <laughs> so ultimately at the end of the day, I think it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's a success, but I wouldn't say it's a failure. It was sort of, to be expected, if you will. Sure. Well, expected by whom, though? <laughs> expected by me, because this is exactly <laughs> where I had them at, right? 80 points versus 81, so. When, you know, talking about, you, you mentioned in there, you know, like under the hood and looking at like kind of it more, some of the pieces more individually than like the the, the broader outlook. And um, there were a couple of like massive success stories. And I think also a couple of really big flops, like, Jake Wallman's obviously like one of the biggest success stories of this entire season with like how much of a step forward he took and whatnot. And then like, you know, goaltending outside of Huso before American Thanksgiving is like kind of one of the biggest flops. And so um, I, I just want to know in your eyes kind of where what other storylines do you think were really big successes in a season that, you know, as expected for sure, what were some of the individual players, storylines, et cetera, that went really well or really poorly. Yeah, I mean, you highlighted one already, and the one that I've been beating the drum on, which is the Jake Wallman train. I think yeah. his emergence this year uh, has really solidified the Red Wings' left defense side now with Simon Edmondson being there and having Jake Wallman. You now have two potentially bona fide top four defensemen on the left side of your defense that are going to be able to solidify mm -hmm. for the next you know, three years at least with Wallman's extension. So, you know, his emergence this year, unbelievable, a huge get for the Red Wings. And it almost makes their their left defensive prospect pool, which is full of guys. I mean, you have Albert Johansson, Emil Vera, whatnot, you know, Shai Booyam, so many guys down there. Uh, that almost makes them be a little bit more expendable because of that emergence. And potentially you can fill gaps in your roster using that that excess pool that you have now. So I think that's the biggest success story for me. Uh, you know, obviously, Billy Husso showed that he has the capacity to handle some of that starting goalie workload, uh, but w w the Wings will have to go out and make sure they do a better job of supporting him and getting him better nights off or more nights off and a little bit better balance with his workload. But outside of those two, I think one of the success stories you're looking at is Jonathan Bergren. If you had looked at the beginning of the year, a lot of people wouldn't have penciled him to be on this roster. Not only does he make this roster, he's a he's an impact player. And at times he was flexed all the way up to the first line, could play down on the third line, excellent passer, uh, you know, really showed a lot with that. But I think what stood out to me was his shot. He's got a much better shot than people give credit for. And so he's a guy that I think is going to be an impact player for the Red Wings down the road and maybe someone you weren't counting on to be there. I think the other, you know, positive storyline is after the really tough start for Mo Sider at the beginning of the year, we saw we saw last year's Mo Sider in the second half of the season. He looked much more confident. He was, you know, challenging physically, challenging offensively, pushing the play, everything you wanted to see. And then, you know, even towards the end of the year, you had a Lucas Raymond hot streak, you know, from his scoring that gives you some hope moving forward. I think we all have to remember both these guys are 22 and 21 years old. Like, Oh, we, we is, preach that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very young, very, very young team. And those two guys in particular are going to be cornerstones. They're just, they're 22 and 21. And even when we talk about the shifting of peaks, we're normally talking about peaks being uh, in terms of peak performance for forwards being around 24 to 26. So Raymond's got a couple years before he's even in what we would consider peak. So, all that being said, I think you saw some of the young guys have really good seasons. You saw the emergence from an unexpected area in Jake Wallman. Um, and then you had some flashes of potential starting goalie in Billy Huso. I would also like to add to pre-injury Michael Rasmussen as a huge win for this organization this season. Um, just the, the, what he, you talk about, obviously, Berggren being able to be flexed up and down. 
uh, the lineup, but Rasmussen's ability to, he kind of solidified himself almost as a top six forward this year. And I think that's a lot of people previous to the season kind of didn't see that as, as his ceiling. And he, after his injury, it felt as if, I know you talked about how goal expected goals four percentage, the team was 4% better after the trade deadline, but it, it felt as if the team and the locker room did lose something once he got injured, like that, that edge that he brought and that ability to get into the corners and make things happen. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you start with me, I'm I was arguably the biggest Michael Rasmussen doubter that was on the internet, <laughs> you know, for for years because and 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 not all of it was necessarily related to 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 his fault and more had to do with the draft position that he was put in, I a agree. lot of the the storylines that came out about him around the time of the draft in terms of a lot of his scoring is sort of related to to the power play. Is he going to get that time at the next level? Uh, it was it was a lot of peeling back the hood at his numbers and, and really painting him into a corner. And then obviously when he has the issues uh, immediately after the draft where he, the Wings weren't really sure where to put him, and then he ends up in the NHL and has a really tough year, uh, that, that first year for him, all of it sort of unraveled. But this year was really the best – we've ever seen Michael Rasmussen and not only does that line up with what you saw on the ice, it lines up in the stats as well. I mean, he was arguably one of the most three or four impactful forwards for the Red Wings this season. And, and you're absolutely right to highlight him because when, when he goes down with the injury, I think a lot of the pieces start to fall out for the wings. You're now having to figure out who's going to move up on the line. Who's going to be that puck retriever guy on Dylan Larkin's line that became a revolving door, you know, for a little bit. And, and, and that was the challenge for the wings. So I think him having a healthy recovery this off season and getting back into it will be critical for the wings moving forward. Absolutely. Uh, we need to go to a quick break, but when we come back, we'll get into the Oliver Moore draft pro prospect profile. But first I got to talk to you guys today about game time. Game time is the place for last minute ticket deals, forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less game time, will credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Get images of your seats before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds, tap two taps, and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you'll never have to dig through another email. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NHL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Segment two, Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are joined by Prashanth Iyer, one of the hosts of Expected by Whom, a winged wheel podcast. And Prashanth, I think we should transition now into talking about that Oliver Moore character out of the United States National Team Development Program. Scotty, I got it right. I just took all of yesterday <laughs> to get it right. I'm really proud of you, man. It is. I joked with Pete, man. It is a mouthful. But uh, Oliver Moore had a really impressive season with the U.S. NTDP program. He finished on their team, I believe, was fourth in scoring this season. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, what centered second line. He's five foot eleven, 176 pounds, shoots left. Uh, Prashanth, this was the guy that you pointed out that you wanted to talk about in this episode. Why don't you give us a little bit of a preview as to why you like Oliver Moore so much. Yeah. Oliver Moore for me, he's a guy that absolutely one fits the, the kind of character player that Steve Eiserman looks for. So, you know, if you go and you ch check out some of the draft profiles on him or read a little bit about what coaches have to say about him, he's a workhorse. He's committed on every shift to emptying the tank. He really wants to go and leave it all out on the ice He's committed to being that all around hockey player. He's not just there to gain points. And he very much talks about, you know, that, that to the media, when, when people ask him those questions, it's, it's always, I want to get better. I'm not even going to think about getting drafted. Every day is about getting in the weight room, working on explosiveness, 
the kind of qualities and character that you're looking for and that Steve Eiserman and Chris Draper have really prioritized and a lot of the guys they've drafted over the last couple of years, setting that piece aside, the thing that excites me most about him is this guy can fly. He is the best skater in this draft. He is probably the most explosive, the fastest. In fact, a lot of people call his comparable Dylan Larkin, that this is a Dylan Larkin comparable guy. I think if you actually go, you guys had Pete Krupski on the other day. I think Pete Krupski has put out a YouTube video of a side-by-side -side of Oliver Moore and Dylan Larkin. And it's basically, it's, it's very similar profiles. The one thing I will say to that is, I think Oliver Moore has a little bit higher end skill. Uh, I think he has the capacity to create a little bit more, but his speed is top end. He's, he's so dangerous. He tells people that he wants to play a little bit like Dylan Larkin and Nathan McKinnon. And if you can add that kind of player <laughs> at ninth overall, you know, I, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so for me, he's a guy that I really am excited about because there is a chance he's sitting there in Detroit's range. You know, Bob McKenzie is often the guy that, you know, gets the actual landing spot of these first round players best. Bob McKenzie's got Oliver Moore at 11th right now. Now that's from his mid season ranking. Obviously that'll be updated by the end of the year, but if that holds true, that's the lowest the wings can pick. And so you're, you're now very firmly in Oliver Moore range. And that's why I think he's a guy very much worth spending some time on. Well, that's the, it's interesting. You bring up kind of uh, draft projection because, you know, like when you look at a uh, uh, prospects, like elite prospects page, they have, you know, all of the projections from like the top 10 sites or whatever, all on there. And they're, they're kind of all over the place that there's some as high as like six or seven. And then there's some that are as you know far back as like 1920, but most have them in that kind of, you know, like 12, 13, 14 range. So I, I guess what I'm asking is why, I don't know, like why not higher? Is that too blunt? Like why, why I love a fast skater. And so I, I guess I'm just wondering, it's kind of scattered a little bit, but there seems to be, as you pointed out, like some consensus of like maybe just outside the top 10. And I guess, why does he find himself there on so many rankings? Well, I think part of it is not his fault. This draft class at the top of the draft is absolutely loaded. I mean, when we're talking about guys like Connor Bedard, Adam Fantilli, Leo Carlson, you know, Mutt Bay Mitchkoff, all of those guys. I mean, that's just exceptional talent you could make the argument that the guys that go top four or even top five in this draft would have gone number one overall in every draft going back to the Jack Hughes yeah. draft, which is 2019. And so that's the level of talent that you're working with. I think the second piece of it is, is obviously on his team. He was the second line center. He wasn't necessarily, he wasn't playing top line minutes. You know, that went to Will Smith and, and, and his line. And so he was playing behind guys already on his own team. And then there's always the question that comes up with these USNTDP guys of the, the system is so good that there's so many good players on there. How many players are a product of playing around so many good players versus how many guys are really true drivers of that system? And I like to bring this back to the 2019 draft always because that was a draft that had a ton of USNTDP guys go in the first round. I mean, we're talking about Jack Hughes, Cam York, Alex Turcott, Cole Caulfield, you know, that entire group over there, you know, there's at least six other names I probably missed uh, just going off the top of my head here. But that, that entire group all saw their stock elevated because of how good they were playing with each other. And I think this team in particular is no different. There's a lot of talent there. And so some of that may come down to that. Some of it may come down to, you know, size questions always. He's 5'11". We'll see what he's actually measured at at the combine. Those generally get inflated. Um, 176 pounds, not the biggest of frames. Uh, you know, so when you're comparing him to a Nathan McKinnon, he does not have McKinnon's size. Uh, but I will say, I think you're you're not going to find a guy with a better motor, a better engine, and really a dedication to, to getting better every day. And so I think that's probably the justification for why he's maybe a little outside or a little bit lower on these lists um, than some would expect. Awesome. And so let's go take another quick break, our last one. And then when we come back, we can just spend the rest of the episode talking about uh, Oliver Moore. Uh, so stay tuned to Lockdown Red Wings. Segment three, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We're joined by Prashant Iyer, co-host of Expected by Whom, a winged wheel podcast. And um, Prashant, 
You mentioned that Oliver Moore kind of fits the Steve Eiserman mold. That leads me to my question of, you know, what is this team's biggest need and why does Oliver Moore fit that need? Yeah. So when you, when you step back and look at this team, I think there's a couple of uh, things that automatically jump out to you. The wings moved out a lot of their goal scoring and playmaking ability at the trade deadline, you know, moving out Tyler Bertuzzi, moving out Jacob Verana, you know, you, you, when you lose that kind of talent on up front, you saw the results on the, after the trade deadline, the wings simply couldn't score goals. They finished the season. I think uh, after the trade deadline scoring 1.8, five on five goals per 60, that's the lowest mark of any team uh, by far. So they need to add a guy that can drive a line that can set up chances and that can ultimately finish those chances. And that's where I think a guy like Oliver Moore fits in. He can push the pace, push the challenge. I mean, imagine having to defend Dylan Larkin and Oliver Moore on two separate lines with that kind of speed, you are always going to be under duress. And so if you look at a little bit of what the avalanche have done with their center combos, it's, it's sort of similar in how you want to have that aggressive pressure and so i think he brings the pace of the game the wings want to play at he brings the playmaking talent he brings the work ethic and he brings that commitment to being an all-around player that'll fit in this more defensive system of Derek alone so i think he's a guy that automatically jumps off the board as being an easy pick for the wings the nice thing about him is with these ncaa guys you're always looking for guys that have established development paths he's going to minnesota next year. So that's a heck of a hockey team. And that's a heck of a place to develop a hockey player for me, knowing that kind of development plans are already in his place. This is absolutely a home run pick for me at nine, 10, 11, if he's available there. What would you say? I don't know, biggest areas to grow still. What are we, what are we looking at in terms of when he does go on that development path? What do you want to see him take the biggest strides in before he obviously reaches the NHL level. Yeah. I think for me, the biggest thing that I'd like to see him work on a little bit more is his shot and beyond his shot. Also looking to score a little bit more. I think he's more in the playmaking mold than the shooting mold. And obviously that's something that, you know, for wings fans is a, is a sore spot because this is a team that sorely lacks finishing talent, not just play drivers, but finishing talent and so that's an area where I think if, if he starts to get better in terms of making the decisions of when to take the offense in its own hands versus when to create for others, I think that sort of maybe decision-making is what I'd like to see him develop a little bit more. And that's where I think, you know, Minnesota is going to be a perfect place to do that. I'd also like to see him add a little bit more lower body strength. He always talks about that already um, as being a means to adding to his explosiveness. But I think the core and lower body strength is what comes down to allowing you to protect the puck better. And that's something we saw with guys like Henrik Zetterberg, who's five foot 10, five foot 11. The reason you couldn't knock Hank off the puck was his core and his lower body was so much stronger than you. Same thing with Pavel Datsuk. He's five foot 10, you know, to be able to do that. So I think if you're looking for areas to really grow its strength, it's offensive decision-making in terms of when to take the play into his own hands and then potentially work on that shot a little bit more. And I think you've got a heck of a hockey player. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you said he's going to Minnesota and Pete mentioned this on yesterday's episode that he doesn't seem any player that's being drafted out of the developmental team, the developmental program going straight to the NHL this next season, maybe even the year after that. Do you see a similar timeline? Do you align yourself with that opinion when it comes to guys like Oliver Moore? Yeah, I, I don't think you would plop him in the NHL next year. I think at a minimum, he's going to need one, if not two years at the NCAA. So you're looking at about three years from now for him to debut. Uh, but we'll see how that all, all plays out. But I think for most of these NCAA guys, I would expect him to at least spend one, if not two years there uh, before making the jump. Okay. Scott, you got any final thoughts on more? Um, I don't think so. I think we covered everything I wanted to get to. Awesome. Well, Prashanth, while I have you here, I'm not going to miss an opportunity to pick your brain a little bit. Um, of the current Red Wings prospects that are on in the organization, which one is exciting you the most? Well, that's tough. Are we? How are we defining prospects? Guys who haven't seen an NHL game yet or guys who maybe made their debut this year? I just want to make sure I give you an how accurate about, how answer. How about we go 
like has not played in an NHL well, game. Yet, I, yet. I, I I don't want to go with that because that would outline that mean Casper wouldn't count, and I feel like Casper should still count with an underneath that. <laughs> yeah, umbrella. I guess, <laughs> but like yeah, for sure, for sure, fair. But like also, you know, if if you want to get into like more like lesser known names, then obviously people that haven't played in the league, either one, I know. Yeah, so obviously, if we use uh, Brian's definition of guys who have played it, you know, a game or maybe whatnot, then Marco Casper has to be your answer in terms of the guy who's sure. most exciting. I think, you know, if you look, if you strictly just pull up the SHL stats and look at his points, it doesn't seem like all that impressive of a season. Uh, you know, he didn't score at a particularly high rate. There are some folks that have do a little bit deeper analysis on the SHL and I've actually been able to build out, uh, you know, goals above replacement models. And, you know, shockingly, Marco Casper was a top 10 player in the SHL by goals above replacement this past season. And that's f- fascinating to me because one, his team that he was on Rogla was not very good this year. And he had to do a lot of the driving and the carrying of that. So that's not just him being, carried by his teammates that's him doing a lot of the driving and as a result the model is sort of ascribing that benefit to him so obviously marco casper is the guy that i think you have to be really really excited about beyond him and you know sort of peeking into the depth chart i think obviously the hot name right now is amadeus lombardi uh (laughs) you know everybody loves him after what he just did in flint and then being able to jump up and play a couple games in grand rapids getting his first professional point there you know, he's an exciting guy. I would, you know, not 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 to temper the fist pumps a little bit, but <laughs> I would say let's not pull the cart before the horse. He's got a lot to still work on in his game, he, especially physically. He's got to hit the weight room. Yeah. If you watch his two games in Grand Rapids, the biggest thing that stands out is he got pushed off the puck a lot. So, you know, he needs to get in the weight room, but it's very clear he's a very smart player, very heady player, a guy that can make, you know, potentially make a roster in a couple of years outside of him. Carter Mazur is the other big name that everyone's been talking about. He had a tremendous year in Denver and then obviously got to jump into Grand Rapids prior to his injury point per game player scores three goals. He looks like an absolute play driver as well. Potentially another Tyler Bertuzzi mold with maybe a little bit more scoring touch. So he's a guy that you definitely have to keep your eye on, you know, moving forward outside of those three guys. There's not a ton in the prospect pool that really truly excites me about guys that could maybe make a be considered difference makers down the road. You know, Cross Hannes in his 30 games looked, you know, interesting at times uh, in Grand Rapids. We'll have to see a little bit more from him. I don't know if he ultimately ends up being a play driving player, though. Shai Buyum uh, didn't necessarily take as big of a step this year at Denver as you would have hoped he would have done. And so there's a little bit of question marks there. I think William Wallander, we need to see a little bit more of in Grand Rapids to know what you have there. He was asked to play a big role in Sweden this year on Rogla, you know, playing 20 plus minutes a night. Um, But I'd like to see what that looks like in Grand Rapids before really getting, you know, too, too excited about it. So I really think whoever the wings draft in the first round this year, if they use both those first round picks are ultimately going to be, the guy's highest on your list in terms of being the next difference makers. For sure. And then, so also Red Wings, this is my last question, I promise, and we'll let you go. <laughs> but Steve Eisman has five picks in the top 50, five picks in the top 45, actually. If you're Steve Eisman, what are you doing with those five picks? Are you trying to make a trade to move up? Are you trying to make a trade to acquire a player now? Or are you using each of those five picks on a player in the draft? Oh man, how much time do you have? Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I can start a timer. And... <laughs> so you know the the answer to this question ultimately comes down to what strategy Eiserman wants to take. You and, and I think this is important, and this is what I've written in my "If I Were Steve Eiserman" pieces the last couple of years. There's never one right path forward to building a team. We've seen that across the NHL. There are a number of ways to get your team to the next level. Even with expansion teams like Seattle and Vegas, both have gone about it in dramatically different ways. You know, Seattle, you know, electing to be very patient, not spending their money, taking their time, adding the right free agents. Vegas basically reinventing how people trade for these expensive players and how to finagle the cap. 
You know, so th there's a lot of ways to go about it. And I think if you're Steve Eiserman, you have one of two options. You're either saying, I want to win with the core that I have right now, and I am committed to making moves that advance this team's performance substantially next season. That's path one. Path two is, okay, even with adding everybody that I added in the offseason, this was still a team that was several points out of a playoff spot, unlikely to really be all that competitive if they were to make the playoffs, given you know the struggles with goaltending in the back half of the season, the, the less than stellar five-on-five -five play, penalty kill obviously not being great. I should consider, you know, tearing down maybe a bit more and looking for the acquisition of more prospects or more picks. In my personal opinion, that path is not appealing to me. You've actually torn down really as much as you can right now. You've made your commitment to Dylan Larkin outside of, you know, trading a David Perron, outside of seeing what someone would give you for, you know, Billy Huso, something like that, you're not really in a position to have players that you can deal at this point to add more. So if I'm Steve Eisenman, I'm going very aggressive. And for the teams that sold their first round picks, because we had a record number of first round picks dealt um, this past trade deadline, there may be a lot of people that want to call and, and, and move up into the 41, 42, 43 spot where the wings will be having their second round picks. There may be teams that want to jump back into the first round at 18. Uh, hopefully if the Isles end up not making the conference finals. <laughs> and, and so there's, there's opportunities for, for Eisman to potentially unload those picks in the name of impact players. I think if you look across the league, who knows what Philly's going to do, they've got pieces that would be very interesting. Travis Konechny, uh very interesting that could be available Winnipeg does if they ultimately lose in the first round to Vegas um you know what do they do with Kyle Connor what do they do with Nikolai Ehlers you know I think those are a couple of players that are really interesting Connor in particular being a Michigan kid and you know having a tremendous finishing talent would be a huge add and then from there there's there's always opportunities to look at Ottawa with Alex to um so I, I think there's there's opportunities to utilize those picks. And if I'm Eisman, that's the route I would be going. I would always have my phone line open and willing to add roster players, not prospects, not more picks, but genuine roster players to advance this team moving forward. Uh, but it has to be a commitment of part of the bigger picture. So that's Scotty and I are right there with you. We, he and I've had conversations. We think this team's at a point now where with the roster they have, they need to start trading to acquire players to really, if they want to really take that next step in this rebuild, do you do you buy that Debrinket stuff though? I read the same. I read that stuff too, and I was like, "Is that real or is that just smoke?" I I mean, from what's been reported so far, I'm not putting any stock in it. It sounds like people are reading into him saying, "I'll let the Senators know what I want to do by the time of the like by the time of the draft." Like, right. it sounds like people are just reading into that a little bit more. And in Detroit in particular, because you have a Farmington Hills kid, you know, you you, you want to read into that even more. And then he's a great goal scorer. So all of a sudden now it's like, oh, my God, Alex Brinkett wants out of Ottawa and he wants to come to Detroit. <laughs> that being said, even if he did, I don't know that he's the right fit for the wings. Um, he's not a play driving forward. He's a goal scorer, but he's going to need to be on somebody's wing to do that. Uh, somebody that can drive that line. So Dylan Larkin. And so ultimately that, that affects your balance a little bit. And then he's going to be quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's got his 9 million poison pill qualifying offer that ultimately set kind of the bar for what a long-term contract looks like for him. And I just don't know that he is the right winger to maybe chase in that scenario versus Kyle Connor versus one of the New Jersey devils wingers. If they can't keep, you know, Jesper Brat and Timo Meyer. if they have to move one of those guys, those are all three guys that I'm putting ahead of to bring at there. Awesome. Scotty, you got any final thoughts or questions, man? Uh, no, I don't think uh, so. We Scotty, won't. Scotty's ready to go record Tigers. He's pumped. <laughs> I am pumped. You're right. I, I want to watch Toronto lose in the first again, too. <laughs> Uh, all right, Prashanth, thank you so much, man, for joining us today. Yeah, it was an absolute you. pleasure. It's always such a blast picking your brain. 
appreciate you guys for having me and look forward to uh, doing it again. Hopefully not a year from now. Hopefully we can <laughs> yeah, do this again sooner, not. right? Well, we have a lot of prospects that we're looking to profile. Do it. We, we do it better than we did last year. We only got to a handful last year. We're going to try and be more proactive and get to more of those first round. One guys of them was Marco year. though. That's all One that of them matters, was Marco. Baby. That's all that matters. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I'll be in contact, reach back uh, out to you to get you back on. Uh, is there anything you want to plug your new podcast? So what do you want to do? Yeah. I mean, you know, if anyone feels free to want to check out a maybe more analytically inclined look at the NHL, definitely a heavy focus of the Red Wings, but also the NHL at large, uh, you know, Sean Shapiro and I have teamed up to, to start a, a new podcast called expected by whom shout out to Mickey Redman for that name. Uh, it's under the wing wheel podcast content, uh, platform. So, you know, feel free to, to check us out. And as always, we're, we're a brand new start here. So, if anyone's got ideas or things they want to see from us, just, just let us know. Awesome. Again, thank you so much, Prashant. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, Scotty, you know what you got to say. I already did. We ball, yeah. Oh, I did you? Did. I didn't catch that. Well, there Sorry, you go. You said it again. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. It'll be just Scotty and I for the Thursday episode. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day. <laughs>